Welcome to Lunch with Tech Leaders, where we have engaging conversations about software development and cloud engineering with industry leaders and subject matter experts. These episodes are created by the Great Lakes Tech Leaders, an online community of technology practitioners. Please come join the conversation by visiting gltl.rbn.ai. Again, that's gltl.rbn.ai. Now strap in, because we're deploying to production in three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Lunch with Tech Leaders. My name is Ray Welker. I'm a cloud engineer with RateBrain Networks, and I'm going to be your host today. Uh, joining me today is software and data consultant, Tom Kowalski. Say hi, Tom. Hello. Hey, and last but not least, uh, we have business technology consultant, Joe Coleman. Hey there, Ray. Thanks for the lovely intro. If anybody listening or in the chat has any questions, feel free to send it in the um, chat here, and I'll make sure that that topic's covered um, in depth here. So thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. So this week, uh, we are bringing you a discussion on GitHub Copilot. Um, we definitely have a lot to cover here today. So grab your lunch and buckle up. All right. And Tom, uh, would you like to yeah, introduce our subject matter experts? Yeah, I'm excited to talk about uh, GitHub Copilot. I haven't used it that much. So yeah, I'm excited to hear what, what our experts here have to, uh, to say about it. And we brought on Kyle Robertson, who's been on before, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Kyle Robertson. Uh, I do work at GitHub, so one thing I do need to say is any opinions that I express are mine and not necessarily GitHub's. Ooh, All sounds right. like you might have some insider info. <laughs> and then also has been on before Lancelot Carlson, if you want to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, sorry I'm not on video. I got a lot going on today, but uh, happy to be here and talk about all the things OpenAI. Um, I have a lot of experience with the API. I have a lot of experience um, building apps on top of it. So, uh, you know, if and we help copilot. And uh, and I use sorry, and I use Copilot on a regular basis. So um, and and I've I've used some of the beta functionality. So um, right, yeah, excellent. Yeah, so sounds like we got a lot of uh, expert uh, expertise here. Um, usually, I just want to start off our podcast giving our listeners uh, kind of some information on you know what we're going to be talking about. So if this is the first time you've ever heard about GitHub Copilot, um, it's really, it's a AI powered tool developed by GitHub and OpenAI. Um, it was first released as a technical preview in 2021, uh, then later released by Microsoft in June of 2022. Um, it's really an assistment, uh, assistant and a uh, enablement tool for developers to you know, write code, um, as it suggests code snippets or, you know, even entire functions just based on natural language input or based on, you know, projects that you're currently working on uh, with the tool enabled or, um, and, and it's trained by, you know, billions of lines of code from, you know, publicly available uh, GitHub repos. Um, it's, it's integrated in a couple different IDEs, uh, most notably you know, Microsoft's Visual Studio Code Editor um, and supports a, a ton of programming languages. Um, yeah, it's their, uh, they hit the nail on the head there, uh, Kyle. Anything else you'd like to add to that? No, that's that's a pretty good description. All right, cool. All right. Um, so yeah, let's... You, you, the, um, it supports a lot of languages, but I will say I think it's better at certain programming, program, programming languages than others. So, um, I mean, yeah, that's one of the features I wanted to get into a little bit, but... Um, what, what's your opinion on that so far? What, what, what has been your experience, Lance? I, I think that in, I think Python is the programming language it's really good at. And so I feel like some of the things it bases its solutions on are sort of Python. And, and then when it kind of like distills like, hey, this is probably a good thing to do in like Ruby or something else, it kind of, it almost has like a Python-esque thought about how that could be implemented. Um, what what languages the, have you used on it? I have used Rust, Ruby, Crystal, Go, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Um, 
So a smattering. <laughs> a python. <laughs> I, in my experience, yeah, I mean, I've, I've found the most value from using it when writing Python. Um, not necessarily uh, programming languages, but I have also used it myself with, um, you know, write, writing uh, CloudFormation, Terraform, Bash, PowerShell. Um, been pretty helpful with those ones in my in my opinion as well. Um, but yeah, I, w- I wonder why it may be leaning that way. Maybe maybe it could be you know the type of repos that it's trained off of. Um, I know I know that uh, yeah it, it is, and there's some controversy around that. Um, that there could be you know uh, public re- repositories out there that it may be reading from that have you know specific licenses on there, but. Uh, I do wonder what the training data looks like. If I um, if I had to guess, like cool. I mean, if you look at like the top languages in GitHub, I'm pretty sure Python's like number one. If it's not, it's very close. So that could have potentially given us some bias. I have no idea, but that's just my like theory. Yeah, I wonder how it case. picks. Like, what's what's good programming practices too versus just what's out there. Right. How, how's your experience with that? Does it kind of give you some bad? All the time. Yeah. <laughs> so I've always said that you have to be a competent pilot for your co-pilot. Um, hmm. But uh, yes, it, you, you, I, as a programmer professionally, do not trust the output, you know, ever. But it, it's... To me, it's more like a really fancy autocomplete. Hmm. I would say yeah. similar experience. It's yeah, it's it. A lot of times, like if I'm thinking about like, oh, I want to make like a config class or something, like it's pretty good at like giving me that. But like, you definitely want to like make sure um, because obviously it can give you things that might not be ideal as well. So uh, let's maybe but, talk about some of the features real quick of of. Copilot, like what, what? What is it saying it offers? Right. Um, I, I know it offers natural language code suggestions, so I can essentially type a comment in, describe what I want to happen, and uh, Copilot will attempt to auto suggest, you know, a function or or something specific within within my function or class that I'm you know trying to achieve. Um, you know, it does support multiple languages. Um, we talked about the autocomplete functionality. Um, its integration with IDEs, uh, and you know what what it's how it's suggesting good code. I, I, I think that that's an interesting concept because yeah, you it could be trained off of a bunch of bad code, right? Maybe it's just not, um, maybe it's not formatted correctly. Maybe it's not following best practices, and you know, do, does that get integrated into the assistant? Um, and and will that lead to you know? bias in the future because if i'm writing the code that you know github is github copilot is producing for me that might be training me to you know write bad practices myself um have you guys noticed anything like that um so i actually wanted to share a statistic that's like actually it's on the copilot website uh so they have a question about like if get copilot writes perfect code and they gave some statistics on like completions and how often they're accepted um, so it says on average, 26% of all completions shown are shown by GitHub pilot that, that they've accepted. Um, and more than 20, on average, more than 20% of developers code files were generated by GitHub copilot. And in certain languages like Python up to 40%. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of is an interesting lead towards what Lance was saying. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Only twenty six percent of suggested code is actually accepted, and forty percent for for Python. Um, I, I've noticed it as chatty as well, just with uh, my limited use as well. Um, I often have to escape uh, what it's suggesting to me because it's just you know outright wrong or does not um, you know meet the need of what I'm trying to write. But I've also felt that it has been fairly helpful at times as well. Um, And Lance's point, mostly with, um, well, in my case, Bash, as well as uh, Python. Um, Cool. So So does that become annoying, right? Like how, what does your flows look like when programming? Like how does this, is it like an autocomplete? It pops up and you, 
Are mo- and what IDEs are you using this in? How, how does the what does the flow look like, and how are you using it? For me, um, yeah, it has been uh, primarily. I've used it in Visual Studio Code. Um, as for the flow, uh, I find it to be most useful when I start uh, with a uh, well designed um, coding template. Uh, essentially, I am I, you know I have a proper main, I have a proper uh, classes set up, functions, well defined variables. Um, code that is uh, properly commented, I find that it learns the best when I am doing um, these best practices to begin with. And it's, you know, it seems to be providing me more helpful prompts that way. Um, in in like an example of something I've used it in for um, something that I actually had written for a customer, um, I was needing to uh, essentially just build out a flow to trigger a uh, code build job and in aws and i had you know properly defined a class that was writing various functions within it and i was like oh i need to write a waiter um because i need to pull to get the uh the status of my current code build job and um i'm like i gotta look that up i need to look into the you know the boda three docs uh, i need to figure out exactly what i need to call and then uh i just open uh, i enabled code copilot and i just started to define my function name and it just generated all the code for me uh, and I thought it was incredibly helpful. It was aware of uh, what was in, you know, within myself class itself and uh, um, was able to generate, you know, a, a waiter that just worked right out of the box. And, you know, it probably saved me 20, 30 minutes um, of trying to look that up and write it myself. Um, but that's that's kind of been my experience and in, in my workflow. So for me, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lance. No, I, I was just going to say, I... I'm kind of backlogged on some some of the things that we were talking about before about code style and whether or not it uh, encourages bad coding. Um, I don't think that's the case uh, for me, at least. Uh, it hasn't suggested anything that was stylistically... Uh, it, well, because it's looking at my personal coding style, I actually it adopts sort of my coding style, which is really nice. And um, so it hasn't... Uh, if you already are a professional programmer, I actually think it it can like just help. Um, you know, it 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 really truly is something that's helping you auto complete your own thoughts because, um, you know, it's uh it's your style and it's not it's not like the general universe of programming. <laughs> um, but in you know even in the general universe, I think that those uh, coding styles that it's that it it's been trained on is actually pretty darn good. Uh, especially for like a newer programmer learning, um, if they're using Copilot, they're going to learn very quickly what's pretty good, um, as long as they are, you know, making sure that they they're not just being lazy and like, hey, this sort of works, you know, <laughs> which which is definitely uh, a, a, how a lot of projects go at at companies. Um, uh, as far as my flow goes, I have had the exact same experience where. Um, especially like if I'm using a framework like Ruby on Rails, there's a lot of code it can reference in my project um, that when I like go into different areas, like if I go into tests or if I go into um, migrations or if I go from a migration to building out a view, I, I actually, there's there's some times where I like I will copy a migration and I will paste. So completely different context of code that won't actually fit inside a view. You know, it's just HTML and and Ruby. I'll copy the migration and I'll put it in my view, and it will generate all the form fields in HTML for me. So it can. It's like if you think about like ChatGPT and how you would ask it questions. You, it's kind of a nice like it, you would you should think of it similarly like, um, where where your prompt. You can put the prompt inside of your code and then start auto completing and then remove the the noise that was there that you that you were prompting it with. Um, but yes, it's uh, it's it's been there have been some very I, I, very good code completions that I've gone through where I've um, it's completely filled out a file based on other files in my project and I didn't have to type that whole darn thing. Like validations, I, I don't. If, if you're familiar with Ruby on Rails, like I was able to fill out all the validations by tabbing through it, um, based on my migration. So stuff like that. Sounds pretty powerful. 
Not to um, mention it built out, it, it was building out we like very scoped out features that it knew from the context of what I was doing in another area. It was, it was, it does some very fancy things sometimes. So how does it do that? Right? Like I'm, I'm try, trying to visualize this flow. Is it like just popping up? Like, Hey, I also added this, this file over here. Like what, what does that look no, like? I don't know. It's just, it's inline code for only the file you're working on, but it, okay. it will suggest things in that instant, in that area that you're working where it's referencing other parts of your code where you're just like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Is that okay. Yep. Okay. And it, it's just got like a feel of like an autocomplete, right? Where you're just, it's like kind of showing you and you, you can keep typing, but right. Is that, is it, so is it using yeah. like the autocomplete of the IDEs, right? It's like tapping into that. You, you press enter and then uh, in the context of where it would complete, and then it, you kind of wait sometimes, and then it'll fill out. Okay. In, in a gray text. And then if you hit tab, it'll give it to you. Got it. Sometimes I'll even tab it out if it's even if it's wrong, but then I'll edit it because it's kind of close, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, it's actually saved me a lot of time recently on like uh, surprisingly some YAML configs. So I was doing some stuff with Datadog. And I was like, oh man, I'm gonna have to type all this stupid stuff out. And it was, I started typing one thing and I was like, oh, doo, 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 doo. and I'm like, oh, that's like everything I need. So that saved me a lot of pain and time. So I do appreciate that. Hmm. I don't know if I'm being paranoid, but I, I know I have certainly had other windows open alongside my Visual Studio code with Copilot running. And it has certainly auto suggested text that I was looking to copy. Um, I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm being paranoid, but it, it seemed aware of uh, other windows that were open in my, in my experience uh, as well. That's uh. weird because I recently was talking to ChatGPT about my problem and I got it to generate code in that scope. And then that I started to go to Copilot and the exact same problem that I was dealing with, it had generated code for in that instant. And I was like, wait, wait, what? Did, did, <laughs> is there a transfer between uh, OpenAI and Copilot? Because I'm confused right now. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've noticed something like that and I wasn't sure if it was a coincidence or, uh, or what, but you know, definitely interesting. Um, so, uh, I mean, I wanted to touch back real quick on something you were saying, Lance. Uh, would you say Copilot is making programming more accessible for new programmers? I should hope so. I would. Re I really hope so. I don't spend enough time with a lot of junior developers, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know. I, I do know that um, some of our junior developers that we did have uh, were definitely leveraging it. Um, but there's obviously with every junior developer, you're still like, you know, the code that you co-piloted was, is not, you have to fix this, this, and that, like, you, you can't just auto complete your way into a job. Um, if you can, you're probably working for the government. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> sorry. Speaking from experience, I've, I've been listening to my friend talk about these other projects. Anyway. Um, Yes, I, 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 I hope it would, but I still think, like, I think it'll get these junior developers up to speed much faster. And I think that's, that's the case across all subjects, whether it's biology or a lawyer or whatever. I think it's going to, you know, get people closer to expertise. Um, there's still the extra mile you have to go, but. But as we were saying, right, like it only does the 26% or whatever, right? Don't you have to have that experience to know like this isn't what I want, right? This this is not good, right? Or to clean it up. So, I, I mean, could it be pushing bad practices? Well, too, here's or? an example. Like, so um, I, I was learning Crystal language, the programming language. Um, it's very close to Ruby, but there are certain things that it can, that are different. And I learned it. I think a lot faster when I was using Copilot because it um, it would suggest certain things um, for me uh, that I wouldn't have necessarily thought about, and then I, I go back and you know it's learning is is a uh, is very much a feedback loop, and so if you're if Copilot is able to speed up your feedback loop, um, you know I I think especially for new people like the 
it, it fills this um, newbie newbie void for you very quickly. I had the same experience when I first learned uh, Linux command line. Like uh, I, I was working for a, a company called Engine Yard and we did hosting and uh, I didn't know command line very well. And they just were just here, here. I'm, I'm going to give you your your manager is going to sit with you for a week and just you know you're just going to run commands with him and that feedback loop I learned you know command line in a week. Oh, I think it's pretty powerful. So I feel like we talked about a lot of the um, positive aspects to it. I mean, like I kind of want to focus on some of the things that you know. Have Have you guys found any limitations to the? Uh, just to co-pilot itself, uh, anything that you kind of wish was there that's not currently there or meeting your needs? I wish one thing that would be nice maybe is like having like, if it also had sort of like a, a chat GTP type interface with it where it could explain to you like, maybe like why this it made this choice or something like that, mm -hmm. um, or being able to have a conversation with it as well to get to like, because the autocomplete part is nice, but sometimes it's like, well, okay, like I'm I'm kind of stuck on this problem. Let's talk through it, and like almost having like that rubber duck sort of thing would be really cool. That would be a really neat feature. Um, yeah, kind of like uh, you know, I, I imagine like Microsoft Clippy or something like that, as it's you know suggesting me code. You know, talk, talk I can talk to it. It can talk, tell me why it maybe suggested a certain block of code. You know, so on and so forth. I think you can get that experience with ChatGPT. Well, right, yeah, to some degree, right. It just would be cool if they like if it was like all in one place together, right? Like if you could in Visual Studio Code not only just have Copilot but also have like you know it integrate with like a Chat GDP type interface as well. I wonder if there's an extension for that. Like, just you can. I thought I saw something. That could very well be. Probably. Does it do exactly what you want, right? I'm sure that's integrations, but um, other things that people had mentioned uh, in the in the chat here were refactorings and um, and uh, those are really interesting. Um, that is still in beta. Um, I had posted a link about that in the channel. Uh, GitHub is is working on some interesting refactoring uh stuff around this and i haven't really played with it a ton i have a little bit it didn't necessarily give me great answers because the code that i had show had shown it was perfect anyway no just kidding but uh you know when you have very declarative uh language in your programming like it's it's going to be hard for it to suggest anything because it's like well okay you you you're basically saying what it should do um but I wonder if if I could take some code that really wasn't that was kind of noodly. I haven't really tried that too much to see if it could refactor it well. Yeah, I think it would be kind of interesting to see it um, myself as as kind of like a code analysis tool as well. Um, so while I am writing code, it, code it is also providing feedback um, on, on what I've written and how I can maybe make this code better. Uh, that's not something I've experienced myself with it so far. Um, the code it does generate, I feel like has been, um, when I accept it, it, it has been, you know, good practice, well, uh, well formatted, um, so on and so forth. But uh, that would be neat to see that for like, you know, a project or something like that, if I could, if I could run that through Copilot, and it could potentially, you know, refactor the code that I have. We do have a uh, question in the chat there, so I interrupt, gents. But um, does Copilot have any competitors? Like, seems like we'd see a copycat. Um, already to the service? That's a good question. There, there was one, um, I forget the name that it was called, uh, but I was looking into this the other day as well. Um, is it called Kite? I believe it was called Kite. But I mean, to my knowledge, I mean, Copilot is the one that is uh, certainly the, um, Forerunner, at least in terms of you know what I'm aware of. Um, yeah, I guess does anybody else know if there is a competitor that provides similar um, similar features? Not Chat, Chat GTP, right? But it's yeah, got yeah, a go. different a different flow, a different. But yeah, <laughs> the maybe they'll come out with of, integration right to your. The IDs. only thing I can think of is that OpenAI has a Codex API, 
available. So I know that there are companies that are building little things around it. Um, one of them I think I saw was like a GitHub pull request thing where it could like, you know, every time you did a pull request, it would try to suggest, you know, um, uh, or review it, code review it. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think, I think those really, it's the API itself, right? <laughs> um, it, but it's, it's the most extensive I've seen so far. So I wanted to ask another question real quick um, before we're running out. Yeah, we are kind of hitting towards the uh, the half hour mark, but uh, how do you how do you guys view Copilot in terms of um, a software developer's uh, current workflow? You know, is this going to be replacing any jobs? Is it going to be modifying jobs? What 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 do you see uh, the future of Copilot bringing us and and just AI in general? I would say. I know the message, at least from GitHub, is Copilot's very much like a productivity tool. So it's not necessarily meant to replace a developer's job, but it's going to save you. Like, I mean, for example, like you know, if I were like a couple, like a year ago, like, hey, I can't figure this problem out. Stack Overflow, search, blah blah blah. Right? Uh, you're kind of cutting that out, that 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 extra time out, right? Where it's just like giving you the answer more directly in your IDE. Um, so I see like it as uh, kind of enhancing productivity through like uh, saving you time where you'd have to do research otherwise. Um, AI as a whole, that's a whole different question. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'll just yeah. uh, unmute here, Ray. Adam, nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what I'm reading in the space is like, the tool is going to, it makes your top performers even faster, right? You can accelerate your workflows from your top performers. And then Lance already touched on, it helps bring your junior people up faster. Um, so I think the end result is like, you. there's potential where you might need less developers because you can, if you have your top performers, all of a sudden can, you know, 3x their, their productivity. You know, you, as an organization, you might need less developers uh, theoretically if the tools are able to um, really increase the product productivity by that factor. So my my overall thought is that, and I've I've heard this before, is that um, at some point, you know, English and being able to express um, thoughts in English really well uh, logically is going to be the ultimate programming language at some point. So critical thinking is going to be important. People that want to innovate and create solutions to problems for other people, those people will always be of value. And these AI things will make those jobs easier to do. Um, uh, right now, interpreting you know, English is slow. And, and, and I don't think that I don't think that English itself is the ultimate programming language still. I think that ultimately there's going to be some generated code underneath it and that there will be value to people understanding that language and also um, you know, being able to generate it. I think it's always going to, it would be better to generate that code um, beyond just your English specification because English is so, has so many concepts in it that are vague which kind of makes it nice for AI in, in many ways because it can solve problems that are vague, right? But um, for the majority of things that need to be performant and just get stuff done and can be easy, you know, it's just step one, two, three, four. I think that that still should be in code and generated. So I see like this combination of um, AI problems, solving AI problems, code still existing, but, you know, um, we are being able to generate all of that uh, much quicker. And hopefully, I hope that it's not going to be a black box one day. I, I hope that people still want to be able to hack around inside and understand that stuff. But there definitely is a possibility that, you know, at least some portion of users will be black boxy where they're just like, generate me this and this and this and this and specific, you know, they get very specific around the edges about the specification, but don't, don't actually have to look at code. But I don't know. Definitely interesting yeah. future. Yeah. Definitely some interesting insight. Um, yeah, before we, uh, before we get to it, I mean, any final takeaways that anybody wants to, to mention? 
I got a question real quick. You, you know, we mentioned talking about uh, open AI, chat GPT, and the kind of like legal ramifications, right, of using the, like the code that's generated in your apps. And um, have you dealt with that in your, your jobs? Probably not as much. Uh, Kyle, since you know, um, all I can really, project. yeah, all I can really say about that is just uh, whatever has been published publicly by GitHub, that's their stance on it. I can't really comment any more than that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My understanding after reading into it a little bit is it is up to the uh, repositories um, owner's discretion to have the proper license on it for uh, either, either for co-pilot to actually learn off of it or not. Um, I know that there is um, some debate on, you know, the legal ramifications of uh, what it's been doing and proper attribu uh, attributions um, for, re for repos it has read on, um, learned off of. Um, I do think that whatever does come of that could be an interesting game changer and, you know, maybe shaping the law of, uh, of AI itself um, and, and more so, you know, learning from other people's work. Um, so there is something that I am following that kind of closely at this point, because I do, I do feel like there is uh, going to be something from that that is of value um, and or changes, you know, the law in general. But but yeah, um, yeah. anything else anybody wants to cover? I'm going to take the nihilist point of view and be like, why? Why does it matter? Why right. do we need attribution? Uh, I mean, if we want to make forward progress, it's there are so many people in the open source community that have made amazing projects based on other people's work and stood on their shoulders. So like, at the end of the day, what like, what is this use? Why are we so obsessed with the source? I mean, obviously, we're trying to make money um, for certain things. That's a different kind of IP protection. But it's data and information is becoming a commodity that's not. If we want to be able to make forward progress, the patented uh, framework is, is really outdated. And we're just going to have to leave it alone. And I don't know. <laughs> Well, I think you mentioned it right there. It's the making money, right? Yeah, that's yeah. what drives. But should we be making money from just being the originator of a data source? I don't know. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely uh, interesting. Regardless of you know uh, how this goes, um, but we are out of time. I know. I want to thank everybody, uh, all of our listeners, and those who joined us here today um, for this episode of Lunch with Tech Leaders. Uh, we definitely hope you found this conversation informative and valuable. Uh, next week, we are going to discuss the impacts of remote work on engineering uh, and with hiring and retention. Uh, and that will be led by our uh, VP of engineering here at Right Brain Networks, uh, Derek Youngie. Uh, as always, that episode uh, will feature expert guests and interactive conversation. So be sure to tune in. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good show, Ray. Good show. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, thank you.